Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Amazing. Amazing. All right. Everyone have a good weekend? Yeah. yeah. Get lots of candy from trick-or-treating? Yeah. You didn't eat too much, though, right? No, no, definitely not. All right, there's a picture that I'm going to have you guys check out on the screen. I want you to tell me if you know what it is. A family tree. Does anyone know what a family tree is? What's a family tree? Correct. That is right. A family tree is a diagram showing the relationships between people um, in several generations of a family. So you guys, you probably have a baby book somewhere at your house. Your mom and dad might have filled that out for you. You should definitely check it out. You have a really cool family tree. It has your aunts and your uncles and your grandparents on there and your brothers and your sisters. Did you know that you have two families? Did you know that? Oh, yes, your church family, correct. We also belong to the family of God. I feel like you guys maybe did some homework without my knowledge. This is awesome. So the Bible contains our family history. It talks to us about, it tells us stories about our ancestors from the Bible, people who had faith and relationships with God. And we call those people saints. On All Saints Day, we remember the believers in the family of God that have gone before us. You might be familiar with St. Peter or St. Paul, um, but there are also others that we have read about in the Bible, along with the men and women who were servants in our own church. So saints are people who have been set apart for God's holy and special purpose. Today, we like to remember and honor all the saints of the Bible and our own church family because they had a relationship with Jesus. And with that, they were willing to follow him and follow his will. These men and women of faith belong to the same family that we do, which is the family of God. So when we lit the candles and we rang the bell, we were honoring all those people who were saints. So as you think about that today, think about your family tree, think about all of those people in the Bible who you can learn from, and think about the people in our own church who we wanted to honor today who are saints in our own life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thank you for the many wonderful saints that followed Jesus down through the ages. Help us to follow their good examples and to remember what a blessing it is to be in the same family of faith. We ask this in your name. Amen. Let us pray. I lift mine eyes into the hills once cometh my help. My help is in the name of the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Grant a blessing on this time spent that the words spoken and the words heard might be one and the same. Spoken and heard, they will be pleasing in your sight. Amen. For the Apostle Paul, the day of the Lord was eminent, was impending, by days, or maybe by weeks, or certainly months. While we may ruminate over how he felt as the time passed, it is clear from all of his writings, he believed that he would see the day of the Lord, the return of Christ, final end days. 2,000 years later, some people spend a great deal of time continuing to look skyward the same imminent, impending event. Well, maybe some are. I really give very little thought, nor am I ever really looking skyward or spending precious seconds of time contemplating some divine timetable to the end of the earth, regardless of what you think or may not think the outcome of whatever happens on Tuesday. Paul is referring to the day of the Lord. 
the same time as I say that, in our scriptures, the word of God, it's there. It's talked about. So it has a point and a purpose. It can't just simply be ignored. But let me get back to that in a bit. I grew up in a small orcharding community on the north slope of Mount Hood. Parkdale, Oregon, population 300. Salute! <laughs> we had an elementary school, a post office, a grocery store, two gas stations, a restaurant, a tavern, two churches, a large fruit packing plant with cold storage, and the main forest service station. Oh, yes. And lots and lots and lots of apple trees and pear trees. There was no traffic light. There were a few stop signs and even one telephone booth. Everybody knew every other buddy. The town grew another hundred people or so during picking and pruning season when the migrant workers would come and go. Pastor of my childhood church was the Reverend Byron Travis, Presbyterian, who spoke with what sounded like the very voice of God, strong, resonant, deep. It's all the family stories tell. It was Byron who tried to keep my father on the straight and narrow as a runaway kid in the Hood River Valley, challenged with alcohol. It was Byron who would run my mom to the hospital when I was being born because my father was up on the mountain. It was Byron who we called to perform our wedding when Jamie and I were getting married. It was Byron who we called a year later when my father died. Every Advent season, it was Byron's card and letter that I looked forward to receiving the most because his letter would start with this wonderful pastoral paragraph bringing focus to the good news of Christ. And it is the example I have tried to follow ever since I began writing our annual letter sometime in the 1990s, long before professional ministry even crossed my mind. Byron's been gone some 12 years now, but I still think of him and reflect upon how he would approach things as I perform the functions of ministry. Marin Tyler was my kindergarten teacher way, way, way back. She was not only my kindergarten teacher, she was my first ski school instructor. I actually used to race. But even as my ski school instructor and my kindergarten instructor, the thing I remember Marin Tyler for the most is that she was the first Sunday school teacher I really remember. Teaching me the stories of the Bible, singing the old Sunday school songs, was in seeking to please Mrs. Tyler that I paid close attention and became that kid everyone hates that knows all the answers to all the questions about all the stories. Remember seeing her at a funeral service held up in Parkdale that I attended with Jessica when she was about three or four years old. Mrs. Tyler was much older at that point. Still remembered me. I never heard of her passing, but by this time she is certainly gone today but it is her memory that I often think of 
when I put up those old Sunday school pictures and PowerPoint presentations to go along with my sermons. Because she's the one that first showed them to me. It was part of that carpooling to kindergarten class that began the close relationship and friendship we have always had with the Roters. My mom and Ernie and Ruth Marie Roter became so close in the years that followed. It's all because Janet, their daughter, and I went to the same kindergarten class, and together we would carpool down one parent driving or the other. It was with sadness that we watched them pack and move off to Washington State following travel orders of the Forest Service several years later. Yet it was because of the closeness that they still came back and helped us pack up when I was 12 years old and my parents divorced and we moved to Portland. As the years passed from then until now, we have been involved in every major event in each other's lives, Christmases and Thanksgiving dinners and graduations and weddings and surgeries. You'll remember that Ruth Marie passed away this past spring. She is the one that was on our prayer list for a time. While none of you met Ernie, he was the one that actually drove my mother out from Oregon this past year so that she could visit. He just kept on going to drive out and see his son in New York City. Those links remain close. It is Ruth Marie and Ernie who provided Jamie and I the example in which we pattern our relationship after. And it continues on even as one of them is gone. After the divorce, living in Portland, Oregon, we began to attend First United Methodist Church in Portland, the largest, most affluent church in all of Oregon for the Methodist Church. Just the place for a divorcee and her two high school age kids. It was really by the graces of Max Pugh, who helped lead the youth ministry program that made it possible for my sister and I to participate fully in every program that ever came up. There was always money available to ensure that we could go to camp or retreats or whatever the it was in the programming. We'd even ensure that we got back and forth from home to church for all those special events since it was 18 miles away one way. Did not realize the gift that Max was to us until Max changed duties in the church and the new person tapped with the responsibility of helping the divorcee and her two children felt it was just way too much a burden and said so. Max died about 20 years ago after a long life of dialysis due to kidney problems. But through Max, I have learned that no one should ever be a burden. The smallest little things are always the helps that make the greatest blessings in a life. As I move forward to the idea of full-time ministry as a vocation, pastoral staff of our home church in Medford, Oregon, became instrumental in starting Jamie and I out in this pathway. The Reverend Derry Burkholter was the associate pastor while we went through that change. He had begun not in Oregon, or even as the United Methodist, but as a Disciples of Christ clergy member here in Ohio and Indiana. In fact, it was Derry who 
was one of the few people from Oregon that came out to visit us in those first years while we were in Portland. He's the one that made Jamie promise that she would go back to school and finish her college education. He's also the one that had a deep conversation with me over the idea of the theology of salvation while he was going through his transition to become a United Methodist. And that is what taught me how to articulate theology. It was soon after that visit here that he got back to Oregon and fell off a ladder, passed away a few days later. These are the saints of my life. Byron, Marin, Ruth Marie, Max, Derry, and so many others that I really don't have time to try and share all those stories. People who have passed unto the arms of God, but before they did that, they impacted and molded my faith in indelible ways that continue and make me who I am. But if that's the case for me, then it's also the case for you. All of us have that list of names of people, lives who have helped shape us and mold us and make us the people of faith that we are today. Here's the secret to that. If you have a list of names, you too might be on someone else's list of names. Hmm? Something that should not be forgotten. But let us return back to that skyward looking question. Now, without a doubt, Jesus said and promised that he would be coming back someday. And I sincerely believe that. One day, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. I've read all the way to the end of the book. I know who wins in the end. And yet, with every generation, we run into that same scene. It's the end of Fiddler on the Roof forced to return and leave their home. Rabbi, wouldn't today be a good day for the Messiah to come? Many times as I watch that movie, each time they still have to pack up and move on. And so it seems to be played out in our lives as well. As much as Paul hoped and prayed in the face of the oncoming reign of real persecution, first from the church itself against the incoming Gentiles, then from the Jews, from the uprising of Christian movement, and finally, formally, from the Roman state, executing Christians for their beliefs. Someday would be the day But rather than trying to calculate the who's and the what's and the when's, for amongst all the signs, all these saints have taught me the same thing. They've taught me to pray, let the day not be today. Because there's still more work for us to do. There's still more lives that need to hear about Jesus Christ. Still more souls that need to be reached. Jesus did not ascend into the heavens saying, Now stand there, all of you, and watch for my imminent return. No. What did Jesus tell the disciples? What did Jesus tell the disciples? Go. Make disciples throughout all the earth, baptizing in my name, teaching all that I have commanded. 
or as we like to paraphrase that in the United Methodist Church, to make and be disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I dare say, as I have known some of these saints that have lived and breathed amongst you and seen their examples, they would say the same. Might we ever continue to be not looking skyward, but looking to our left and our right for the next person that needs a saint in their lives. Amen.